Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to be talking about the assassination of Iranian nuclear scientist Mohsen Pakhrizadeh. Now the assassination took place on Friday. There are varying reports even from Iran on how it took place. There are reports that there were armed gunmen and also recently Iranian authorities have claimed that there was a remote explosive device that was used. What is certain nonetheless is the fact that this is yet another major strike against Iran. Uh, Iran, of course, has blamed Israel. Many observers have claimed that Israel has in fact pointed him out before as a significant part of Iran's earlier nuclear program, of course. But we're going to be talking about what the assassination means, what Israel, the US, and its allies in the region are trying to do. And we have with us Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us so quickly. Uh, over the past few weeks, the number of developments, the sanctions in Iran have continued. There was a secret meeting which was leaked between Benjamin Netanyahu and Salman bin Mohammed when Mike Pompeo was in Saudi Arabia. And now we have the assassination of a very prominent Iranian nuclear scientist. So in these few months that Donald Trump has left, presumably, what are this group of allies actually trying to do? Well, I think two things we should register. This is not the first time Iranian nuclear scientists have been assassinated. This is, in fact, a set of series of assassinations which had stopped in the middle, but this is the latest in that sense. Of course, it is a combination of uh, within Iran, certain groups who have been against the Iranian government, who have carried out terrorist activities in different parts, and Israeli intelligence agencies who have quite proudly taken credit for such assassinations in the past. And even this time, they seem to be tacitly accepting that they were behind the assassination. So that is one part of it. And I'll come to also this, what you talked about, uh, Fakhr Sadr being identified by Netanyahu in 2018, when he talked about Iran's nuclear program. If you remember, he presented a bottle with a fuse in it, which actually was quite laughable uh, in, in the sense that nothing was backed up in that uh, statement that Iran is almost at the nuclear uh, threshold. So all of this has been Israel's campaign to get the US to act against Iran in one way or the other, because Israel by itself cannot militarily attack Iran. It wants the United States to do so, because the consequence of such an attack, if it is unilaterally done, would be quite significant for Israel as well. So that's why they need the United States to do so. So provocation of this kind particularly when you have a lame duck President Trump. That, I think, is what we had discussed earlier as well, that the attempt by Israel and the Trump administration is to leave a scenario in West Asia by which the clock cannot be set back. That means you lock all the contestants in a place from which collision is inevitable and the return to a diplomacy, path of diplomacy, return to normal, a relationship that is there between uh, states, even when they disagree, because after all, agreement, disagreement are part of international process. So conflicts are contained by dis discussions, negotiations, and contestation. That is the normal process of international relationship. But in this case, not to have anything but contestation and leaving out any negotiations, any process apart from hostilities. This is the Trump administration's uh, gift to, the, to West Asia now before he leaves. And Israel is very clearly wanting a war with Iran before Trump leaves so that for the foreseeable future, Netanyahu will be protected in Israel. He's under severe stress, corruption charges, various other problems that he has. And of course, Israel being the, uh, the major power in West Asia, slowly losing its total hegemony that it had militarily over the, uh, over the region. I think that is also something that Israel would like to uh, postpone and therefore taking out Iran at this stage. I think the assassination is clearly an attempt to provoke Iran to respond in a manner by which then Trump and Netanyahu, Pompeo can all get together to attack Iran. Two issues that are there is what is the two MBS, MBZs going to do, the two crown princes, that it, it's also clear that uh, they, there have been threats to both by Iran, even earlier, saying that if the US wants to attack Iran, 
we had the ability to retaliate, retaliate against you. Two of the Saudi oil installations were attacked by the Houthis. And it has been construed internationally as signs that Iran can hit back at Saudi Arabia, particularly its oil infrastructure. And apparently, this is the Middle East Eyes report, apparently MBZ uh, was warned by the Iranian administration that in case there is an attack on Iran, then they would retaliate against also UAE, particularly as UAE has normalized its relations with Israel. Israeli officials are now there in uh, Dubai. So all of this also means that if they can, Israel can get both bin Salman and United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, on their side in a milit military uh, attack against Iran, with, of course, the United States participation, that would leave Iran in a difficult position. So their response has been to warn both United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia that whether we can attack Israel or not, you guys are, would be in our crosshairs in such an eventuality. I think this is the broad picture that we see. Absolutely. And it's interesting also because uh, Iran has been taking extra efforts to ensure that there is no conflict in the time leading to the Trump administration's uh, leaving. For instance, they've asked Iraqi militias also to make sure they step down. But I wanted to come to the point you mentioned earlier about uh, the nuclear program of Iran. Now, Netanyahu, of course, pointed out that like you said, that it was going, it was just a matter of time before Iran had nuclear weapons all over. But the record actually shows that Iran has never, at least in the recent past, has not had any kind of military nuclear program. So could you talk a bit about that? You know, this is again one of those Israeli myths which have been propagated by almost all Western news agencies that Fakhrizadeh was the nuclear weapons program head. Now, Nuclear weapons program head is presumably because in the IIEA final assessment report, which was submitted in 2003, they had talked about a uh, set of activities that Iran had carried out, which would give them nuclear weapons capability. Now, what does it really mean? If you remember, nuclear weapons uh, capability is not a huge scientific issue. After all, this is something which the Manhattan Project showed took place how many years back? Almost 55, 75 years back. So this took place 75 years back. Technologically, something that could be achieved in, in the 40s is certainly within the reach of any scientific community today with a certain infrastructure uh, background, which of course Iran has. There's no question about that. What was discussed was, did it have, and this is about the final assessment report, which concluded that by 2003, and this is IAEA's official uh, final assessment report on Iranian nuclear uh, weapons program, which they investigated, was that they had a set of activities before 2003, which had or was trying to look at weapons capability. That these were activities which could be then used if they wanted to develop weapons. So it was really about weapons capability rather than building a bomb. And that is the basic distinction we have to make that yes, uh, Iran was looking at capabilities rather than a weapons program. And they had, admittedly, there is nothing secret about it. They had the capability perhaps by 2003 if they wanted to build nuclear weapons to go ahead and do it. They took a decision not to do it. And it is also behind uh, the reason that why, because of this decision, that they wound down these programs completely. And they also uh, then opened themselves to various inspections by IAEA, including enhanced inspections, which they stopped only because of continued demand that they should submit to inspections, complete open inspections of every facility in Iran without a reciprocal guarantee of lifting of the sanctions. Now, they had the Iraq experience before that, that IAEA inspectors, which had American uh, component in it, had mapped out every bit of the infrastructure of Iraq, and that was used later on the attack on Iraq. 
So they were not going to ask uh, Iranian, uh, they, they were not going to ask the uh, IAEA inspectors, which had Western agencies participating in it, to open, them, uh, open every door in Iran and let them see every bit of military uh, facility that it had. And that was the basic bottleneck which came about. But 2007, 16 spy agencies in the United States had given a statement saying they do not see any remnant of a weapons program. And as I said, it was not a weapons program as much as a capabilities program. And therefore, they did not perceive that Iran was continuing on that line at all. And this, when finally the agreement, when the Obama and uh, under the Obama administration, when the negotiations was finally done with Iran, then the agreement said that Iran will give up 97% of its enriched uranium stock, which they did. They also destroyed a very large part of their centrifuges or deactivated them. They dismantled one of the nuclear reactors. So they had taken a significant steps in six months to implement all the demands that had been made. But what happened was, of course, that the United States did not reciprocate to the extent that it was supposed to be done. And under Trump withdrew from the agreement. The sanctions still continue. And the, there are global sanctions because other countries have not been able to withstand American sanctions on, or the threat of American sanctions on them if they trade with Iran. So effectively, Iran got nothing out of the nuclear deal, at least for the long, long run. Now, what do they do? That's a different question. But the issue is, did they have a nuclear weapons program before 2003? No, they seem to have nuclear capability program, but not a weapons program. And did they assemble a nuclear weapons before 2003? No. Did they actually weaponize the capabilities? Seems no. This is the IAEA's assessment as well, not what I'm saying. And post-2003, there is no significant development that can be attributed as a weapons program. You know, when, when you talk about dual-use technology, the nature of dual-use technology, that what creates the ability to have a nuclear trigger is the same one that uses, is actually used for creating industrial diamonds. So these are all dual-use technologies of different kinds. And if you want a country to give up all dual-use technology, you're really asking it to remain in the, uh, not exactly the Stone Age, but at least in the Iron Age only. Now, no country which wants to be an advanced economy can do that. And now those are the kind of demands Israel would like to put on uh, Iran, so that Iran effectively remains as a third-rate economic power. And that's, the, that's a demand which Iran is never going to accept. And therefore, Israel's demand is really is to have a war with Iran. And I think the whole weapons uh, program uh, myth that Israel has built repeatedly, including the pictures Netanyahu showed in the United Nations uh, platform, all of this point to the fact that this uh, vilification campaign backed up by various interested parties who have really tried to isolate Iran and see that the United States attack attacks Iran. And Trump seems to have been very much interested in it. He backed away from it time and again, taking the final step, probably under the military's advice, that a war, a war on Iran was not something which was desirable. And it's something after the Afghan war, after the Iraq war, that is not something which would help in the long run, the US hegemony on the world. So Trump did not receive the support that he probably wanted to what uh, to have a war on Iran, but he still has been actively uh, considering, according to uh, press reports, that whether a strike against Iran is possible, against its nuclear reactors is possible. And of course, it, the spin off would be it could spill into a war with Iran as well. So the lesser of the step has been assassination programs. We had Soleimani's assassination earlier, and now we have. Pakhrisadeh's assassination. All of this is to see if Iran can be goaded into action. At the moment, Iran is not responding in that way. But Iran believes in a, that its institutional memory would be long. And it is not that it is not going to respond. But when and how it will respond is something it will see. It will not respond in kind. It will not do an assassination versus assassination. 
but it will take steps tomorrow to how to counter Israel in the region. And I think Iran's even earlier response to the assassination of Soleimani was that their response would be drive the United States out of Iran. That would be their response. What would be its response to Israel, we would have to see. But respond they will. A military response, most probably no. An assassination versus assassination, I don't think they're going to tread that path. So they're going to, at least for next two and a half months, till Biden comes, like to see what would develop. And only when uh, Biden takes charge and all att attempts for rest restarting the Iran agreement fails, then they will probably look at options before them. But I don't think they're going to respond in the next two and a half months unless they're completely forced into action by hostile acts like bombing their harbors, bombing their nuclear facilities, in which case, of course, they would have to respond in some way. Thank you so much, Prabir, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching your screen. Thank <laughs> you.